Welcome to chapter 24, which is going to focus a lot on the idea of speciation. So we've talked about microevolution, which is going to be the kind of generational changes bit by bit. But if you add up enough of those micro changes, you get what we call macro change. So it's not anything new. It's more just a matter of the scope of time you're looking at. And eventually, if enough time passes, where you get enough differences that build up, we tend to want to in some way reflect the fact that this organism as it stands now is not the same as it was before. And that's kind of this idea of declaring it a new species. So species is completely a man-made construct to help us organize, so don't get too caught up with it. But this will come up with some of the ways we use to try to figure out what we should define as a species and how that kind of happens. Uh, the guy here that we have, this beautiful little bird, is a vampire finch. So this is probably the coolest finch that Darwin was able to see when he went to the Galapagos Islands. They have one of the sharpest, pointiest beaks of the finches, and this allows for them to go up to typically other birds, and they would in some case peck and cause blood to flow, and they would lap up the blood. So this is not the only thing that they feed upon. In this case, it's feeding upon nectar from a flower, which it does. It's not like bleeding the flower, but the fact that it's able to drink the blood of birds and it's a little finch is pretty sweet. So I put it there because I like it. So for macroevolution, this idea of speciation will occur in two possible ways. The first way, anagenesis, uh, is oftentimes going to be called phyletic evolution. And the idea here is where one organism gradually changes to become kind of like a new organism. So this would be like if all the people that we had continue to get taller and taller and taller. So the original shorter population becomes the new bigger population after we'll say 100,000 years. And so now because they're all taller, we want to in some way reflect the fact that they've changed. So we say this is now a new species. It's kind of morphed from species A to like a new species A, a if you will. Whereas cladogenesis, which is the more common one that they refer to, which is oftentimes referred to also as branching evolution, is where we end up with one species, that's our initial ancestor here, and it kind of breaks apart into multiple populations. Each population adapts as needed for its own particular environment, and so we end up getting where it branches out. And so in this case, you could still have a relatively normal original population that exists, so you could have some that still look like the ancestral, ancestral finch. You can also have multiple different new populations that eventually become their own species. So this would be a lot like what we talked about with the Galapagos finches, where you had one species of finch from the mainland likely reached the islands. And then as they each adapted to the different foods and the different islands that are part of the Galapagos archipelago, which is just a group of islands, uh, they eventually became about 15 different species, and a lot of the differences showed up in the beaks, which you can see here, uh, based on what their food source is. They were selected to have different types of beaks that allowed them to go for that particular food source or to live in that particular environment on the island. So in this case, we had not just one to one, which is more anagenesis, we had one to 15, which is cladogenesis, and you might also see the word adaptive radiation where you see a, a relatively small number of species or a single species gets into a new environment that has lots of available niches or, or spots it could use, and so it rapidly it branches out and evolves into many different species. And so if you see them talk about an adaptive radiation, that's what they're talking about. And that's not uncommon to happen on islands, because you arrive at the island, not necessarily a whole lot of people on the island, so there's lots of opportunities, and so a lot of branching can occur relatively rapidly because of that. Adaptive radiations also are popular after mass extinctions, because suddenly there's a lot of things available. Uh, so some of these things were vacated permanently, and so you can move in because the old guy's gone. You know, dinosaurs disappear, mammals got a shot. So next, what is a species? All right, this one's a tough one. As I've said before, a species is really our concept to organize. So it's kind of difficult to put our hands on because nature didn't make a species. Nature doesn't label things a species. So the biological species concept developed by a guy named Mayer, and this one, if I remember right, was probably about the 50s, uh, is one of the most commonly used attempts to define a species. And this will define it by a group of individuals that in nature will not reproduce with other groups. So if you have a fox and a wolf, the idea there is that they A, either would not come in contact with each other, and B, if they did in nature, they would not look at each other and think sexy time. 
they would normally look at each other and think either that's food or that's competition. And so because of this, they're reproductively isolated. They will not intermix their genetics. And so this graph down here shows Drosophila, that's just fruit flies. And so if you feed them different foods and let them go long enough, as they adapt to that food, you can get these changes. When I mix them back together, if you don't see this kind of idea, where they look at each other and still think, hey, looks like a regular old fruit fly, we should make babies. If you don't get this, then these guys would be reproductively isolated because they only breed with one another. Therefore, this group can continue to evolve its own direction and continue to be selected its own way. And this group will continue its own separate way. So for it to be a species, you typically want to have this reproductive isolation. Now, this is not the only species concept. So as we're going to discuss here coming up, there's several different ways of defining a species. This just happens to be the most preferred one. So if I'm defaulting to something, think that I'm defaulting to the biological species concept. Now we talked about reproductive isolation. Let's talk about how that can happen. So the first group is going to be called prezygotic because this is before you will get fertilization of an embryo, or I should say fertilization of an ovum to make a zygote, which will develop into an embryo. So if we don't even get a wisp of pregnancy or a fertile egg, that's what we're talking about here. So the simplest ways would be like habitat. You know, I have a water snake that lives in the water its whole life, and I've got a terrestrial snake that lives in the desert. These two will never meet, so they are isolated by their habitat. This could also be as simple as something lives in the trees and something lives solely on the ground. And so because of that, they're never at the same venue at the same time. They won't bump into each other. That's habitat. Then you've got behavioral. Behavioral is going to come down to things that are normally like mating rituals. Uh, so this could be mating songs, it could be mating dances, but you will not recognize one another as a mate because they don't do the right things. So for instance, if you look at this wonderful set of boobies here, uh, these are blue-footed boobies, and so they have a mating ritual whereby the, ma the male typically grabs a stick, carries it in his mouth because, I don't know, that advertise a sexy time or something and then with his feet he'll just do like this weird lift up put down kind of thing and if it manages to get the female hot and bothered then ultimately it looks like they're gonna have babies together if not he walks away dejectedly and tries to find another female that will give him the time of day if you are a blue-footed booby and you don't do the right dance the ladies don't see you as a potential suitor or a potential mate and so you don't reproduce and so you would not be part of that reproductive population. This can also be like fireflies that blink in certain patterns to demonstrate who they want for a mate. Uh, but this is going to be something like frogs. It could be the way they croak. But it's something kind of identifying that you are a person that they can mate with, but it's behavioral. Temporal. This is if you're not reproducing at the same time, typically. So for instance, we have cicadas where some of them come out. Periodic cicadas usually come out in around July. And then there's things like dog day cicadas that come out in August. If they're not out trying to reproduce at the same time, they will not come into contact with each other, even if they're in the exact same place, the exact same environment, the exact same trees, because they're off in time. So the habitat might be identical, the behaviors could even be identical, but they're just never going to be at the same place at the same time. And that's the key. There's mechanical, and I put sugar gliders here because they're very, very cute, but they also have a forked penis. And so the female obligingly has a forked vagina. If you do not have the right genitalia to allow this to work, it's kind of like square peg round hole. In this case, there's no squares, but that's fine. Uh, so it will not work. There are other organisms like this that are just incapable mechanically of making this work. You could also say something like a whale and a chihuahua not going to happen, both for habitat and mechanically you're just going to get a dead chihuahua. So mechanical is going to be where something will not agree to allow the physical act of copulation to occur, even if they both wanted to. You know, even if they're both on the same page, let's do this thing, not going to happen. And then gametic is the last one where a typical ovum or egg, as you might call it, uh, this is just the kind of single cell that the female has that the sperm will ultimately try to penetrate to cause a zygote to form, which will develop into a baby that typically has a jelly coat, a layer that surrounds it. And sperm have this acrosome, which is just a little, you can think of it like a vacuole or a vesicle, that has enzymes in it that break down the jelly coat. But if you have the wrong enzymes, 
you can't break down the jelly coat. So even if the sperm is near the egg, you're not going to get a viable offspring. So this is why we've said before, you can swim in like a pond or a river where there's plenty of different types of crustaceans and fish that have their sperm that they just release into the water and you don't come out and have the little mermaid or lobster boy because they would not be able to, even if the sperm and the ovum were together, it would not be able to result in fertilization because they don't have the proper enzymes. They kind of lack the proper key to unlock the ovum or the egg. And so that would be gametic isolation, where at that point you could have even had successful copulation in terms of the act of sex, but you're not going to get a pregnancy that results. So that's prezygotic isolation. Now postzygotic, and I think we'll leave it off here and pick up with the other types of species concepts with the next one. Postzygotic is where we ultimately do get uh, a fertilization event. So we typically would get some type of pregnancy, but things still don't turn out well in the end. And the first chance of this is reduced hybrid viability. So this is where the offspring will normally die during the pregnancy or shortly thereafter. So your offspring's just kind of like gimpy, messed up, and it's not going to be healthy to make it to adulthood. So this one's going to die as a baby or in the womb or before it reaches adulthood. Then there's reduced hybrid fertility, which is going to be something like a mule where it's born but it's sterile. It can't reproduce typically with other mules, and it can't reproduce with the donkey or a horse, which is what we mix to get the mule. So it's kind of just an island, if you will, uh, genetically, where it's just not compatible with other stuff. Because once it was produced, even though the chromosome numbers and the genes were close enough with the mule and the horse to allow it to kind of exist and appear healthy, the sex chromosomes are one of the things that tends to differ more rapidly, and so those don't jive. And so because of that, you have where it becomes infertile. And so this is fairly common with ligers, mules, I'm pretty sure zorses and some of these other interesting crosses, wolfens and whatnot. Uh, most of those end up being sterile if they're pretty severe crosses. They might still live, they might even be healthy, but they're not going to perpetuate. And then in some cases, specifically the one I'm aware of is cotton, so this is not like the most common, you get what's called hybrid breakdown, where the first generation appears to be cool. You know, seems healthy, seems fertile, but then you see it's like the next generation, the second generation, or maybe even the third, that ends up either dying or being infertile. And so you still cannot indefinitely continue that line, but you did at least get one generation out of it. So it's a little bit more interesting than just regular old infertility uh, or regular old death, because at least initially it appears that all is well. The problem doesn't show up until the next generation or the one after that. So that's hybrid breakdown. Okay, we're going to stop it there and we'll pick up with the other species concepts and critiques of the biological species concept with the next podcast. Take it easy.